The Aryan Brotherhood of Texas is one of the most violent hate groups in America. The Aryan Brotherhood, one of the most powerful and notorious gangs in the history of U.S. prisons. The first known prison gangs emerged in the United States in the 1950s, in states such as Washington and California, followed by gangs in other states. From the beginning, a number of these prison gangs were race-based, such as the Mexican Mafia. However, it was the formation of the Aryan Brotherhood in California in the 1960s that introduced a new type of prison gang, one that combined traditional gang activities with an ideological infusion of white supremacy. The Aryan Brotherhood formed in the wake of the desegregation of California's prison system. In the 1960s and 1970s, the prison systems of many states were racially segregated, sometimes for racist reasons and sometimes because prison administrators found there was less violence when prisoners were housed with inmates of their own background. Various court decisions led to the dismantling of race-based state prison systems between the 1960s and the 1980s. Typically, such desegregation efforts were followed by increased violence and periods of race-based gang formation within prison walls. From the beginning, many, though not all, of the white prison gangs that formed during this period adopted elements of white supremacy, often influenced by the earlier example of the Aryan Brotherhood. The 1980s were the first major period of white supremacist gang formation, with many of the largest and oldest such gangs forming during this period including the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, the Aryan Circle, the Aryan Warriors, the Ohio Aryan Brotherhood, and others. The influence of the original Aryan Brotherhood can be seen clearly in the names of many such early gangs. White supremacist prison gangs continued to form in the 1990s, a period that also saw significant street activity by such gangs, especially in states such as Texas and California. In California, which has the most white supremacist gangs in the United States, cross-fertilization between white supremacist prison gangs and other white supremacist groups, noticeably racist skinhead gangs, really took root with a number of gangs essentially becoming hybrids, part white street gang, part racist skinhead gang, and part white supremacist prison gang. This phenomenon eventually helped create an entire white power and peckerwood subculture in California especially Southern California, emerging primarily from poorer white or mixed white and Latino communities. However, it was in the 21st century that white supremacist prison gangs were really able to expand, both in numbers and geographically. A primary reason was the growth of methamphetamines as an illegal drug of choice. In 1996, the Drug Enforcement Agency seized, in its various enforcement actions, a total of 751 kilograms of meth. By 2000, the amount had more than doubled. Unlike cocaine or heroin, drugs based on substances, like poppies or coca leaves, grown abroad, so-called meth labs can make meth practically anywhere, from abandoned houses to motel rooms. Another method of meth manufacture, the so-called shake and bake method, is even simpler, though it produces smaller quantities. Once a substance abused primarily in western states and dealt by outlaw motorcycle gangs, meth moved east becoming particularly popular in the Midwest and the South, with white supremacist prison gangs increasingly involved in its manufacture or distribution. This helped fuel the creation or growth of a number of white supremacist prison gangs in the Midwest and South, with states such as Indiana, Missouri, and Tennessee developing significant racist prison gang problems. Many such gangs were also subsequently able to capitalize on the later boom in prescription painkiller abuse. Today, White supremacist gangs are active in the Federal Bureau of Prisons as well as in most state prison systems. Large county jails also often have to contend with such gangs in the regions where they are active. Moreover, such gangs are increasingly active on the streets. Though many people might think of white supremacist prison gangs in terms of grizzled Aryan Brotherhood members serving life terms, the average felony prison sentence in most states is only two to three years so gang members are often back on the streets relatively quickly. Moreover, many white supremacist gangs now recruit on the streets as well as behind bars. Another source of recruits is gang members' own children. Some gang members actually groom their own teenage children as future potential members or prospects for their gangs. One can find such children identifying with their parents' gangs on social media. White supremacist prison gangs are significantly different from other types of white supremacist groups. 
The most important difference is that prison gangs are a form of organized crime. Almost all white supremacist prison gangs give a higher priority, often a much higher priority, to criminal motives such as profit than to the ideological motives most important to more traditional white supremacist groups. Some prison gangs even formally enshrine this priority in their constitutions or by laws. The nature and purpose of their white supremacist ideology is also different from many other white supremacist groups. First, their version of white supremacist ideology is often cruder than that of neo-Nazis or other white supremacists. The earliest prison gangs often cobbled together their own homebrewed versions of white supremacy, occasionally influenced by literature from outside extremist groups or from Ku Klux Klan members or by other extremists placed behind bars. Other, more ideological types of white supremacists often shunned members of white supremacist prison gangs, both behind bars and on the streets, frequently claiming that the gangs poisoned the white race by selling drugs to whites. This is still true today, to some degree, but to a lesser extent. In recent years, the expansion of white supremacist gangs into the streets, coupled with their strong internet presence, has both allowed white supremacist prison gang members more access to broader white supremacist propaganda and ideology, while also creating increased connections between white supremacist prison gang members and other white supremacists. Beginning around 2006, the growth of social media websites increasingly fueled these connections. The Anti-Defamation League's Center on Extremism has examined thousands of social media profiles of white supremacist gang members. Although one might think that members of organized crime groups might be reluctant to use social media websites, nothing could be further from the truth. Such sites have become an important way for members of such groups to keep in touch with each other, bond with each other, reinforce group values and ties, and even occasionally issue instructions. Social media has also allowed gang members to make contact with a variety of other white supremacists and one can often see the Facebook profiles of white supremacist prison gang members containing friends who are fellow gang members and associates but also friends who belong to a plethora of a number of other white supremacist groups or causes. The growing popularity of Odinism, a white supremacist version of the modern revival of ancient Norse religions, among both white supremacist prison gang members and other white supremacists has also led to increased connections. A number of white supremacist gang members now consider themselves Odinists. They may belong to Odinist groups with prison ministries or join free world Odinist groups when out of prison. These various connections have resulted in some white supremacist gang members, and even some gangs as a whole, becoming more ideological. The White Knights of America, for example, a Texas and Arizona-based gang, have not only built connections with a number of other white supremacist groups but have even created their own group website, one that looks little different from the websites of many neo-Nazi, Klan, or other white supremacist websites. Despite these increasing ties, white supremacist gang members as a whole are definitely less ideological than their counterparts in other racist movements. Whereas the majority of members of a group like the National Socialist Movement are likely to be highly ideological, the typical large white supremacist prison gang will have a relatively small number of members with significant knowledge of white supremacist ideology, a larger number of members with slight knowledge, and an equal or even larger still pool of members whose beliefs may be little more than crude racism. Another difference between white supremacist prison gangs and other white supremacist groups is the use to which such ideology is put. Prison gangs are a form of organized crime and groups that engage in organized crime must find a way, if they wish to thrive, to convince members to put the welfare of the group over that of the individual. Familial ties, ethnicity, group bonding, religion, and subcultural affiliations are all methods that various organized crime groups may use to try to instill that group loyalty. White supremacist prison gangs use race and white supremacist ideology as ways to bond members together. To this, such gangs will often add the notion of a racial family of sorts, with references to our white family or our Aryan family, and encouraging members to call each other brothers. Gangs also take advantage of the Peckerwood subculture that has arisen in many prison systems among white prison gangs and their associates and hangers-on. The term Peckerwood was originally a racial epithet used by African Americans against whites. In prisons in the South, some whites embraced the epithet and began using it to refer to themselves, or sometimes the shorter term would. 
The term became associated with members and associates of white supremacist prison gangs. Women who consider themselves part of the subculture refer to themselves as featherwoods or feathers. Often white gang members in a particular prison are collectively referred to as the woodpile. The subculture is also used as a bonding mechanism by white supremacist prison gangs. Behind bars, white supremacist prison gangs and their membership engage in a wide variety of criminal activities, often violent. Profit-oriented crimes include smuggling illegal drugs and other contraband substances and items into prisons, protection rackets, scams and frauds, sometimes even perpetrated by prisoners on victims in the free world, among others. Gang-oriented crimes include acts of violence against rival gang members or other targeted inmates. They also include violence against members of their own gang, often because a member may be suspected as an informer or because the member has broken gang rules. Large white supremacist prison gangs such as the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas and the Aryan Circle have killed a large number of their own members and associates. The use of force also helps keep other gang members in line. Lastly, gang members may engage in hate-related violence stemming directly from their white supremacist ideology. Timothy Lee York received a five-year sentence in 2012 after being convicted of such a crime. York, a member of the United Aryan Brotherhood and an inmate in a federal prison in Texas, tried to kill his cellmate, strangling him to the point of unconsciousness, then beating and kicking him. York later admitted that the only reason for the attack was because his cellmate was Jewish. Sometimes the violence is also designed to keep other white inmates in line as well. For example, in 2014, two inmates in a federal prison in Georgia, one a member of the Aryan resistance militia and the other a member of soldiers of Aryan culture, were convicted of second-degree murder for beating to death a fellow white inmate who had refused to protest against having an African-American cellmate. On the streets, white supremacist prison gang members also engage in a wide array of criminal activities, some of it organized and some committed by members on their own initiative. The manufacture, import or sale of illegal drugs is the most important such activity, but burglary rings, identity theft, and other schemes are also common. Gang-oriented violence also takes place in the free world as well as behind bars, as does hate-related violence. Aryan Brotherhood of Texas member Stephen Scott Cantrell, for example, received a 37-year prison sentence in 2011 for a string of hate-related arsons directed largely against African Americans, Hispanics, and Jews. There is no doubt that white supremacist prison gangs commit more murders than any other type of white supremacist in the United States. Some of these murders are directed against their own membership, while others are directed at rival gangs or for traditional criminal reasons, and a minority consist of hate-related incidents. The gangs combine the criminal intent and know-how of organized crime with the racism and hate of white supremacy, making them doubly dangerous.